Vinyl technology, like film, is an analog technology. It's physical. We're analog. One of the greatest composers of all time said that 70% of human harmony is lost in a digital recording. So when you hear something recorded on vinyl or live, it feels different. You know it if you go to a concert. It's a whole different experience. Well, it's like that with vinyl. Well, film's like that. Film is 17 times more information on film than a digital recording. Um, so, but it takes about one or two million dollars to start a vinyl factory. That sounds like a lot of money, but if there's a good business there to be had, you can raise one or two million dollars. The problem for film is it takes three billion dollars to create a film factory. Eastman Business Park, where Kodak makes films, has two off-the-grid power plants, giant power plants, a half a billion dollars worth of piping, a mile-long production roll, where literally giant rolls of film go through it, two fire engine brigades, the Kodak Fire Department, and a train, right? That's what it takes to create film. So when someone says, oh, is you gonna charge a little bit more to develop your film? Yeah, <laughs> it's a lot to create, you know, this huge overhead. So anyway, my husband walks in, he's handed a draft press release to, cut down, to shut down the film factory. So here's where your business minds come in. Always question, question, question. So on paper, his job, well, his job is to turn around Kodak, this iconic American company. There's one piece of the business that's only 4% of Kodak's overall business, and it is losing $100 million a year. It is hemorrhaging money. All the top studios have said they're not going to go and buy any more film. But he had the tenacity to say to his board that had just hired him, wait a minute, you just hired me. I'm going to Give me a couple months here. I want to look into this decision. He went to Hollywood and basically he met with everybody, all the big studios, you know who they are, and they all said, yeah, it's a really sad day for film when he laid out the numbers, but we're just not going to be buying. We're going 100% digital. Then he was about to leave town. He came up with a lot of creative ways in which they could invest in other parts of Kodak and keep Phil open, and, but they, they weren't interested in that. So then he um, happened to have a lunch with Christopher Nolan. Do you know who Christopher Nolan is, the director? Interstellar, Batman, and the owners of IMAX. You know IMAX? And he ex no, the found the, the the couple that Harvey helped. Weinstein. Yeah, no, not Harvey Weinstein. Although there's another story about Harvey Weinstein. But he had that. He had the um. I'm they're a couple. I can't. Sure. I'm blanking on their name. Think, yeah. So anyway, so they <coughs> own IMAX, and IMAX is of course giant film, which is why it looks so beautiful. And um, and and Christopher Nolan has just said, well, I'll make an. I'll never shoot digitally. I will never make another film again. Film is so superior. It's my craft, I'm an artist. And think about this. He said something very powerful. He said, when acrylic paint was invented, nobody said that oil paint should be made obsolete. In other words, so this is where you have to start thinking differently. We have been hearing a story for as long as you've been alive that the whole world is going digital and that we're on this train and digital's better and it's X number of pixels and Y number of pixels and the more pixels you have, the better. Guess what? There's still, what digital film photography does is it spends a huge amount in post-production trying to look as close as it can to film and it's still not even close. And all the top directors in the world know it. So yesterday, we put out a press release so, um, and, and I'll tell you a little bit about how that came about, but Steven Spielberg, Quentin Tarantino, J.J. Abrams, just finished Star Wars, right? You know all these people, you know these names, right? And many, 20 of the world's greatest directors. Not a product endorsement, they never do that. Not, we didn't, 
Kodak had no money to pay them to say thanks. They came up and they showed up for Kodak because Kodak has showed up for them. Because my husband kept that film factory open and with their help, talked to all the artists and all the artists talked to their studios and explained, as Quentin Tarantino said, he said, I'll go to graphic novels. I wanted to make seven more films in my life. I'm not making another film. If it's digital, it's not film. It's a video, I'm not making videos. That's not what he does, right? And the same Spielberg, he said, I started on Super with my Super 8 camera. I then graduated up to having a 16 millimeter. Then I went to 35. And then when, these are all Kodak film, right? Then when I went to do Schindler's List, Kodak went back and they recreated the original film formula from the 1940s. So every single one of these directors had very personal stories of how they learned on film. And yet the received wisdom, and this is why you get into these conversations and your job is to think differently about it. The received wisdom is that everything's headlong going digital, the film is dead. Well, when you start hearing things like question. So anyway, uh, cut a long story short, the artists got together, they talked to, and we continue to do this to every studio. My husband went back, renegotiated every contract, and they were able to come to a, an agreement with their customers to buy film for the next few years. And um, the wonderful news is that from the $100 million loss, <coughs> Uh, it is now break-even this month. So it's an am amazing story. And so the next piece is then, how do you make sure, and you stop me if I'm going on too long. Um, then how do you make sure that, that young people like you, because it's, don't get me wrong, Kodak invented digital photography. It's really important that digital is around. It's accessible, it's cheap, it's easy. But there is something precious about film. It is stunningly beautiful. And it's important that you all get a chance to use it and that we make it accessible. We need to get to film students because a lot of the, um, a lot of this, the, the, uh, the, the film schools haven't had access to film cameras and film and film developing. And um, with the digital industry, was like the perfect storm. The digital industry at its most organized, at the same time as Kodak in its least, the least ability to fight back because it was going through bankruptcy a couple of years ago. Um, it just became this received wisdom that there was no way of making it work. So now we've kept the, the last film factory in the world open. And if it had closed, there would never be, no one was gonna spend $3 billion on creating a film factory. It just doesn't make any sense. So we kept it open. There are 90 films. If you go to the Kodak website, you'll see probably some of your favorite films or that we've won deals all this last year, shot on film. And now how do we make it great again? How do we get to the students, so the next generation? So that's what the buzz at CES was about. CES is all about virtual reality and digital, everything. And yesterday, in the middle of all that, we announced the first Super 8 camera to be made in 50 years. And it is a combination, which has never been done before, of digital and film. So you get to make your film on film, but it records digitally, you send it to Kodak, and Kodak will send you a copy on the DVD and also your film reel. So this is the first of its kind. For Kodak, it's huge because it represents the company's first move back into the consumer market. And every single major director that we asked showed up and wrote the most beautiful descriptions of why they use films. So if you go to Business Wire or go to the Kodak.com website and look at the press release, spend a few minutes looking at all your favorite directors and what they wanted to say about film. Stephen, Steve Bellamy was calling Steven Spielberg. He was on his plane going to a shoot and he literally rewrote what he wanted to say seven times because he so wanted to get it right. And so 
we're at the beginning of the what we call renaissance of analog. And you're going to see a lot of other things coming out of Kodak. Um, and I just want to be really clear. It's about digital and film working together to be the best of it. We're not trying to, like I say, Kodak invented digital photography. It has a billion dollars worth of business in the digital um, in the digital business part of the business. But what can you take from this? When you're in business, be tenacious. Question everything. Deep dive into every single decision you make and be the smartest person in the room because you've done the most homework. Because even people that were whose jobs it was to know those numbers got they got those numbers wrong on occasion. So try, you know, problem solve. If you feel that business is where you want to go, I mean, I, I have loved being in business because business is about problem solving. Wouldn't you say? The, the, well, that's why it's so important that we created this camera, the Super 8, because it's the first time in 50 years that it's been made again. So it's a huge bet. And again, remember, we're trying to make film profitable, right? So we have to invest a lot of money to bring out a camera. So it's a bet. <coughs> Everyone was saying, you're crazy to my husband in the company. Like, what are you, are you doubling down on this? You know? And of course, yesterday was so amazing for the team to have 11 min million tweets. It was in the world coming saying, thank God, that's my favorite thing in the world, right? I want one of those. And to have all those 20 directors I think you of all people should for sure make sure you read through the press release because never before ever has there been a, um, an accumulation of quotes from the world's best directors and different perspectives, including small independent producers and uh, directors as well. Why film is different. It was the first time this ever happened. Okay. Um, so... How do you start? Um, what we want to do is create, um, and again, it's, it's, my husband wants to hire 100 interns. I would love you to consider applying for one of those positions. And what he, as he said, this should be the dream job. Your job will be to go to film festivals and evangelize film, and you will, um, Go and do social media around film, and you'll be doing what you love, um, and you'll get to um, get cameras into the hands of the, um, we have to identify, um, and this is all like, it's like being at a 120-year-old startup, right? <laughs> we need a few good men and women. Um, so we have to identify what are the top schools that have stuck by film through these years. And sometimes it's surprising. I was with um, a student from Yale uh, just a couple of months ago, and she was telling me that the Yale School of Film has stuck with still, and by the way, um, we're talking motion picture, but Kodak makes still professional <coughs> photography um, film as well. So anybody, you know, all the top photographers are working with that too. So um, we have to get those Super 8 cameras to the colleges. That's one of the reasons why Jeff wanted to create it was because he wanted to make sure that the next generation of people like you get a chance to know what your craft is. And what we heard from all the directors of the film schools across the country that we spoke to is that if you don't learn on film, you don't know the fundamentals of really important things like light and shadow. Um, you don't know some really basic things about that moment of the discipline of lights, camera, action. If you go to a Tarantino shoot, everybody is getting ready for that moment where it's lights, camera, action, roll, and, and everybody's in place, and everybody's doing their job, and everything has to be perfect. And the camera rolls, and it, and it films. If you go to a digital shoot, you'll have maybe as many as 15 cameras capturing things from different angles, because perhaps, not always, 
but perhaps the director didn't have the discipline of film, and so they're going to basically cover their you-know-what by filming from so many different angles that they get something, right? Well, then what happens is, whereas the top, you know, the, the well-trained, disciplined director goes in and says, um, wow, I got that shot, that was perfect. That 15 minutes of film was just nailed it. And I know exactly what it is, and I looked at the looked at it overnight, and that's the piece that's going to make it into the script, into the, into the final edit. Versus the digital one, where everybody's on their iPhones and nobody's really paying attention because you've got planned obsolescence of 15 cameras in the room. Then you get into post-production, and they're like, the dirt's, oh my God, you, where do you begin to sort that out? And so this is what we've sort of been, what we've heard from talking to directors is that We've been sold kind of a, a false bill of goods. Yes, it is true that to buy the film itself on the front end is a little more expensive. And, but if you look at the entire value chain, when it's at post-production, it's a lot cheaper. And it's, you, if you've done any building work or anything in your life, if you've fixed as much as a faucet, you'll know that changing the faucet is cheap. You could buy a faucet for 30, 20, 30 bucks, but the guy, the plumber, is gonna cost you $100 to, to put the faucet. So the money is spent in people. So if you've got engineers and tons of people in post-production that you're paying for to fix this thing and get you out of the mess of God knows what you shot last night, you know? So, so what we're hearing from the teachers of film is that they want all their students, no matter what they choose to shoot on ultimately, to have the choice of film and, then to, and the discipline of learning their craft. And as an artist, many of the directors have said, I'm an artist, I like to choose the material I work with, and I want the choice of film. And it almost went away. I mean, the world doesn't understand it was that close. The draft press release to close down the last film factory in the world was on my husband's desk. It was that close. I have no doubt that in the long run, we'll be, hopefully you'll remember this, and 10 years or 15 years or five years, books will be written about this. You know, because this was a very important moment in time. And yesterday was very important because we did not know how the world was going to react to that little camera that could. You know? <laughs> and the world just embraced it, and we had that tremendous goodwill from all those top directors who all started out without a budget and with a little camera called the Super 8, you know? And so I would encourage you to um, get into, uh, just work with a school where you have the chance of getting your hands on some of the, some of them, I mean, we, we're still building this thing, right? So I think in the fall is when it will come out, we'll do a limited production, and then 2016, we'll be able to, and we will certainly be donating a lot of those to film schools. That's a huge part of what we want to do here. Um, and, um, and get that in the hands of students. And um, I'd love to take your card and uh, put you in the, the mix of... There's another thing. Um, having spent my career in PR, um, I think this is a story that we need to tell because we've heard from a lot of directors and it's just the multiple, multiple layers. Because when you've been in a place where Kodak's been in bankruptcy and not able to tell its story and everybody just believes it's dead and the digital industry had been very well organized, and not to be conspiracy, it's just the way it is. Their job is to sell more cameras and they're doing it really well. They're doing it really well and they're also selling a lot of uh, digital projectors. In, in the time that you've grown up, when we, when we were watching film, we would go to the theater and it would all be up until five years ago. It was all projected on film. And um, the studios basically said they weren't gonna support that anymore, so then the movie theaters had to go out and buy, uh, and they had to basically convert to digital projection, otherwise they wouldn't get the film. You can't be a theater and survive and not get Star Wars because it hasn't been sent to you, <laughs> you know? So they were, they were forced to bear, bear the cost of buying $100,000 up and down digital projectors 
And the idea was this is going to be far more efficient and easy and what have you. Well, guess what? How many iPhones or super smartphones or whatever or, or pieces of technology have you gone through in the last five to ten years? Quite a few. Well, it turns out it, a, 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 a film projector lasts 60, 70, 80 years. When it breaks down, it's a little widget that needs to be fixed, a screw. A digital projector is obsolete after just a couple of years. So guess what? You just didn't, you have your little theater. You you you've invested a hundred a hundred thousand in this projector, and now you've got to do another one. Otherwise, it's not going to be able to take the latest film because every film that's shot on film now, for the most part, is projected digitally, which does bring down the quality of the film sadly. So you might see now, for example, Quentin Tarantino which was, again, a part of an effort that we've been doing together. Quentin literally sent out his team with the Weinstein brothers, and they went out and, from scrap yards, <coughs> bought digital projectors. And put those, in, and there are 50, and this is the, it, Christopher Nolan did it with Interstellar too. Um, but really, it's the second time only this has happened. And the first time it's shot on 70 millimeter Kodak film. And you, can go right now and watch um, Hateful Eight, which may be too old for some of you. You need to go, maybe the college students should go and see Hateful Eight. You can go see Hateful Eight projected on film at 50 theaters around the United States, where they literally went up. There's eight of them I know in the Bay Area. I would think there's one in Vegas. I think there is. Um, and so the, what, the next thing we need to do is get projection happening on film. Why does that matter? I'm going to give you a short example. And you just, I can talk forever on this stuff, so you shut me up if I'm talking too much. But the best quick story, uh, we were at the British Film Institute watching the great film, Lawrence of Arabia, one of the classic British films of all time. There's an amazing scene in the desert where the son is trying to find his father who's about to die of... Uh, exhaustion and, and dehydration in the desert. And the son's galloping through the desert on his camel and the father is about to die um, and collapse. And then this climactic moment where they, he sees, he thinks, on the horizon, something like a figure. And then you see, oh my God, it's his father. He's found him in the searing heat of the desert. And then the amazing... Da, 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 da. You know, that amazing Lawrence of Arabia music comes up and, it's, and they reunite. In the digital projection of Lawrence of Arabia, the father is not in the desert. That moment where he sees him, it's not there. I've never seen such a good example of why film projected on film, because of course Lawrence of Arabia was made on film, there was no digital then but projected on film is such a different experience. There's another thing, you may have heard of your iPads, your iPhones, there's a blue light. It's a somewhat stressful experience for your eyes to be looking at screens, hour upon hour upon hour, you've heard that. Film's different. It's not a stressful experience. I, I challenge you, go and see Hateful Eight projected on film. And it's, and it's a tough film. I mean, it's pretty violent. It's Tarantino, right? He makes pretty violent films. It's beautifully shot. And it is a somewhat more restful experience on your eye. Now, I don't know the science behind that. As a game, we're like a, we're like a 120 year old startup. We need to literally get scientists to s explain that. And maybe we'll be able to explain it. And maybe we won't. You know? But it is different. And, and that's what you are fundamentally, you feel it. So, um, so learn, learn your craft, learn film, go see it projected on film, support theatres that project on film. There are very few of them around, but you can find them. Hateful Eight is the best example right now because he insisted, because he's Tarantino, and he cared and he insisted. So I think, I think we need to start a campaign called Demand Film to get... As Christopher Nolan said, and this is how he feels, he shoots on Batman and Interstellar, all shot on film, and he said, and I'll end with this, he said, 
He creates on film, and he wants to see his films projected on film in the theaters. The film theaters are wondering and scratching their head as to why people are watching so much stuff at home. Well, if it's the same experience, if you're basically just looking at a giant digital screen, some people have that at home. Why would they bother going to the theater? But as he said, you would never, he is an artist, and he said you would never put a photocopy of a Picasso oil painting in a museum and try and fake somebody at 200 feet. So I think the next movement here is demand film, go support the artists that, and theaters that project on film, seek them out, and we will vote with our feet as people that, that this is an experience worth having. And so you can be part of that movement. You're the, you're the, the actually the, the, the generation that get why film's important. Most of the time I hear all over the world are under 20. So.